everyone is fearful of, hey, you gotta be careful. You cannot yeah. love money yeah. because that's evil. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. But I'm like, yo, why are we so scared of a thing that is showing us what happens when you don't have God? Okay. <laughs> is that we are in the information age. Right. So there's an overflow of information, but a lack of transformation. And the only way for there to be transformation, which is there to be legitimate change, is there for it to be application. I gotta write this down, man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I gotta, I gotta write this stuff down, man. Come on, baby. So transformational content is not just giving you information. It's giving you the practical steps and process, and most importantly, accountability. I am yeah. enraged with ambition to prove everyone that says I can't wrong. You look at the color of my skin, you don't know how much of my bank account. I think what you realize is that externally, there is an injustice. Externally, yes. things aren't right. But also, what a man think of, oh, so is in his heart, so is he, right? Preach, man, preach. So, and guess what? We are the solution. Mm. I'm sorry, the White House is not the solution. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. So my guest today is none other than Jamal Miller, who was Raised in Louisiana, <laughs> went to Bible college here in Dallas, took a pastoral in Illinois, but I discovered him with his YouTube channel, with his YouTube episode talking about went from part-time to 20,000 a month in income, went from food stamps to building a $10 million company. So Jamal, welcome Thanks, to the Seven Figure Squad, brother. Man, I'm super excited to be here, bro. I I'm excited for, for you to grace our presence because the biggest question is, or the biggest, I should say, <laughs> negative feedback I get from judgmental Christians. Come on, man. <laughs> It's real. It's, you shouldn't go out there and try to become wealthy or get rich and this, this, and that. But at the same time, too, uh, we've got a lot of uh, controversy around this topic. And I think um, for the most part, people uh, uh, confuse religion with their faith. And so yeah. we're going to unpack that today. Let's do it, man. So um, talk to us about you being raised in Louisiana. What, what, what type of uh, per if I was a... Uh, if I was uh, in school with you, what type of person is Jamal in high school? Man, before Jesus? Before Jesus. I was quiet. Really? I was really reserved, um, very insecure, um, you know, constantly, you know, comparing myself to everyone else. And, you know, I was the short kid, man. So um, I had this short man complex where it was like all the other guys were getting bigger. They were getting all the girls. And I'm just like, God, <laughs> where are you? You know, and so I struggled, man, big time with my identity. And um, it wasn't until coming into a relationship with Christ in a real way, yeah. a radical way, that I finally stopped looking at everybody else, started looking at Him, yeah. and that transfer of confidence, man, completely changed everything, and post-Jesus, I became the most radical, yeah. outspoken, you yeah. know, person that uh, everybody wanted to yeah. have a conversation with, um, and I give all the glory to God. So, man, that yeah. was, you know, in high school, I was, I would say my, uh, definitely was Bible thumper, you know okay, what I'm saying? Really? My junior year and senior year of high school, man, uh -huh. I started a Bible study. Um, we ended up seeing right around 500 kids come to know Christ through that mm, Bible study, wow. preach the gospels on top of my lunch table, uh, you know, my senior year of high really? school. Really? So you were doing this during lunchtime? Yeah, man, during lunchtime. Um, stood on top That's of the lunch table. I started like at the seat. And I was talking about sex and like why Adam and Eve were virgins and yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like the whole, and then somebody was like, that's not true. Ain't no way. How do they know how to do it? I was in the same way you figured out how to do it. You know, so I was just going, they were like, man, we can't hear you. And I was like, you can't hear me? So I stood on the table, I looked at my principal and he was like, he knew who I was. And he was like, and I just said, hey, I want to tell y'all right now and started sharing the gospel. Were your, were your parents and, pastors? Um, no, parents are not pastors, man. That's what I'm telling you. Wow. You know, God, God really changed me. And, wow. um, and so, yeah, that started my journey. Into, I, I, I'm, I'm just going back to you lunchtime. You asked about Louisiana. You asked about Louisiana. I give you Louisiana, Jamal. <laughs> so, Louisiana, Jamal. So, how would lunch start? So, okay, I, I'm, I'm picturing myself. I'm getting yeah. my lunch. I'm getting lunch trays. So, you're going to get the full story. So, it was very strategic. Um, so, we would do... Bible studies on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then we would, which would be in the classroom during the lunchtime. All the Bible study students will come take their lunch and go upstairs, and we would call it equipment time. We would teach, train, and wow. pray. Mondays and Wednesdays, we would go downstairs, yeah. and that's when we will strategically be placed throughout the lunchroom to begin yeah. and kind of have conversations with different students. Oh. Well, this time, we actually strategically had our youth ministry sponsor us yeah. to sponsor Chick-fil-A sandwiches. So we got 300 Chick-fil-A sandwiches, and we said, hey, 
hey, if you want a Chick-fil-A sandwich, you've got to sit in this area, <laughs> right? So 300, we're giving away Chick-fil-A sandwiches. All these kids are sitting around this area. Yeah. So that's when I'm starting to talk and sharing yeah. about sex and virginity yes. and, yes. you know, and God yeah. wanting to do that whole thing. And asking somebody was like, yo, bro, if you're going to talk, talk louder. Yes. And I had already had all the students, their interest, because I gave them Chick-fil-A. So I still have yeah. a lunch table. And that's when I started to preach the gospel. And that's when we saw hundreds of kids come to know Christ. In that Praise moment. the Lord. I, you know, it's interesting <laughs> that you mentioned that because you won souls for Christ through their stomach. And my, my attempt <laughs> Come on, to, man. to win souls for Christ through the pocketbook, That's right. through, through their finances, Yeah, because uh, this is an area that a lot of people have conflict in, and this is an area where the, the enemy loves to roam, steal, kill, and devour, uh, financially speaking. So... Um, so what are some of the what are some of the things that you realize that as you you're coming up uh, that you realize in your journey to to you know building a business yeah man uh, building um, you know a, 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 your financial uh, status to be able to to employ people and to to have investments back into your company the question I have is what did religion teach you that your faith disproved about that religious teaching and what did faith reveal to you this is how you should really be going about things so for me you know the number one scripture that everyone attacks right is yeah. the love of money is the root of all evil okay so when we look at that passage of scripture everyone is fearful of hey you got to be careful you cannot yeah. love money yeah. because that's evil yeah. it's bad yeah. but i'm like yo why are we so scared of a thing that is that is showing us what happens when you don't have God. Okay. <laughs> when you are not in a right relationship with God, anything can happen. You can become addicted to money, addicted to pill, addicted to drugs, addicted yeah. to success, yeah. addicted to power, addicted yeah. to whatever it is. And it's just giving us shining light that out of all the things you can be addicted to, money is one of the most powerful things sure. that can draw you away from this thing, this yeah. powerful relationship with Jesus. But if you have that relationship with God mm -hmm. and you have that place where you understand his heart and yeah. you know what he desires yeah. and what he wants to see happen, there is no way for you to not be infused with purpose mm -hmm. and destiny and come into contact with the reason you were born and why you were made. And the last time I checked, yeah. once you come into the reality of why you were made, you then come into the reality of how am I going to fund this purpose? Hello. How am I going to fulfill this thing that God has called me to do yeah. when it's going to in some way and somehow involve me changing? Changing people's lives that I've got to be able to get access to them mm -hmm. and I've got to be able to do have some form of resource some form of funding and the church has only been able to do it by way of hey everybody if you believe in this mission yeah <laughs> that's right if you believe in this vision <laughs> Come on, yeah, come on, where you place, at? Place, place, place. the place, yeah. everybody. <laughs> we got a front. building to build. Come on, we want to reach our city. We want to, come on, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that message, man, I'm sorry. We rely on the people to yeah. fund it versus our ability to go create ventures yeah. that we don't got to ask for a dime because yeah. yeah. it's already been paid for. Yeah. So when I came into that reality, I said, we've got, I'm not knocking how it's being done, yeah. but I don't believe this is the only, only way. way. When, when, um, Sorry, I started preaching. No, 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 no. We're, we're about to get into it too. We're about to get into it too because you know you in, in your um, CBN uh, interview. There's a there's a we'll put we'll put that uh, uh, a picture of it right here. But in that interview, that the fi the financial situation that you're in, you lost your confidence as a man as a provider. Yes, sir. And and thank God you, you picked the right wife. Yes, sir. Because uh, uh, many um, people that you meet on Facebook. <laughs> Yeah. End up story. being, you know, catfish, not, what they call it. Right, right. And Natasha ended up being who she, she, she said real she, thing, you know, she was. And thank God for a, a, an amazing woman in your life. Um, but in, in that process, though, what was going through your mind when you're sitting in a pit of nothing and a lot of doubt, disbelief, failure was sitting in your mind? How did you process and fight through it? Well, the first thing, right, we hit the moment where when I hit that bottom pit, I had already experienced many breakthroughs. What I call it, I already had history with God. Okay. So when I hit that pit, it required me, it forced me to pull on that history. Okay. Because first thing that's going to come into question is, is God good? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. is he good or is he not? Yeah. Because I'm sitting in this moment and I'm like, God, I'm sorry, man. Like, why am I here? I've been faithfully tithing. I love my wife. Mm -hmm. I went to Bible college. I was a virgin. I began to pull on my works. <laughs> okay, okay. I began to pull on, this is what all I have done. And I was forgetting what he had done. And that, I would say, was the catalyst for the breakthrough. Jamal, don't worry about what you've done. What has he done and yeah. what can he do? Yeah. And so, man, when we were on that bottom place, it was really challenging because what I realized was I had done the very thing that I 
you know, was, I guess you can say they say, don't do, which is I made money my God. And I had allowed, you know, whenever I didn't have it, yeah. And we were on food stamps. Yeah. I was driving Uber. I was, you know, working a part-time job, trying yeah. to build my business. Yeah. And we literally get to a point where nothing was working. Nothing was working. And it was at that point that I was like, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. But I need, like, I need, I need, I need clarity. Like, I need breakthrough. So that next Sunday morning at mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. a pastor starts preaching, gets into an altar call, and he's like, I don't know who this is for. But see, you, somebody in here is struggling with the spirit of mammon. You've put God, no, you put God in the passenger seat, and you've now allowed money to take drive. Uh oh. And I begin to just like, you know, you go into that moment where you yeah. go in with God, and I'm hearing, and I'm seeing myself like walk through the moments where I'm seeing money is determining my behavior, mm -hmm. my decisions, it's determining my mood. When we got it, we're good. When we're not, we're bad. I'm like, yo. Yeah. This is really, this is it. Yep. And then he says, hey, you need to break that. And he's like, I, I, and my pastor's not the one to do one of those, hey, give $1,000 right now. Yeah, yeah. He's, I've never seen him do it. But in that moment, he was like, I'm, gonna call, I'm, a, I'm challenging you right now. If this is you, you need to put God back in the driver's seat. And so $1,000. At that point in my life, I had never sold that much money before. And I'm giving the dollar amount because I, I want people, it's a part of the story. How I much never, money did you, you said you had? A, what a couple grand still left in the bank? Maybe it was like yeah. maybe like eighteen hundred, two thousand dollars. <laughs> and so going to the green room, I'm really close to my pastor. Going to the green room, he, and this is first service. I didn't do yeah. it, but we got a second service. <laughs> so I go in the green room, and I'm like, "You yeah, guys working on you?" A thousand dollars. He's like, "You ain't never gave a thousand dollars." And I was like, "No, that's a lot of money." <laughs> and he was just like, "Well, call your wife." And I call Natasha. I'm like, "Babe, I think this is us." Yeah. And she's like, "Well, babe, what's the prayer?" What do you believe in God for? And I, in that moment with her on the phone, I said, babe, I'm telling God, I don't want just a check in the mail. I don't want just a, a, a promotion. I don't want something that just will be temporary. I want an idea. I want something that's going to last generations. So we sold that $1,000. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I heard from the Spirit of God when the moment I sold that $1,000 was, wow. what you just sowed as a seed Will become your tithe and man life has not been the same since that moment because wow. you talk about being an extravagant giver can you explain what it being an extravagant giver is how, you, how would you define that to me i would say extravagant giver is being an obedient giver and just living the lifestyle of 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 giving yeah. here's the thing that most people think extravagant is you having to constantly give over and above and it's all this money, yeah. I believe no extravagance is consistency. Yeah. Because what it is is that most people just do it once a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they'll do it when the big moment comes with, you know, right. with the bucket out front for Christmas time. Yeah. Versus how am I being doing this consistently? How am yeah. I doing this with extravagance to where this is becoming part of my lifestyle to the degree yeah. people would say, man, one day I can't wait to buy somebody a car. Ooh, one day I can't wait to buy somebody a house. So they'll say those things, I can't wait to be an extravagant giver. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm like, hey, you can't buy someone a house right now, but you can pay for their car note. You may not be able to buy somebody a house, I mean, a car right now, but you can pay for their car note. You may not be able to buy a house right now, but you can pay for their mortgage. So that was what I did. When, in college, I would pay for people's car note. Well, guess what happened? Three, about maybe six, seven years later, I was able to buy somebody a car in cash. <laughs> what a cool feeling, right? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but it didn't start with me yeah. starting with the car. It started yeah. with the car note. Yeah. So you can be extravagant right where you are, yeah. starting with what you have. Because I think a lot of people compare. Yes. Like externally, like if 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 I if I was go to a typical you know uh, fundraising event, you know we have this to auction off, this to auction off. Okay, who can I get to do one thousand? Who can I get to do five thousand? And it becomes a competition. Exactly. And it becomes about that. And then and if and, and if you're in a per, you know sitting there in your person like okay I can't let them outgive me, mm -hmm. you know because we got this we got that and it becomes that type of conversation, but if it's between you and God, exactly. it's, it's a completely uh, uh, different conversation. Yeah, I say it like this, right? The signs of a mature believer yeah. is the ability to do the basic things consistently. Yeah. A lot of yeah. times we think a mature believer is the one that can hear from God these big moments, they can hear the audible voice from God. No, 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 I just want, can you hear, can you just pray every day? Yeah. Can you read your Bible every day? Yeah. Can you help somebody out every day? The mature believer is the person that can do the basic things every single day. And I believe giving and being generous is something we should do. Yeah. And you can practice that in your own way every single day. In your opinion, why are there more verses about money and handling possessions than there are about prayer? 
Man, that is, <laughs> I truly believe it's because when it comes down to the money conversation, God already knew that it would be something that would be a consistent problem in every generation. But at the same time, where I come into a place of questioning is God, how do we take how you did it in the word and apply it to every single context of a society? Because how we're experiencing it today is very yeah. different than how they're experiencing it 2,000 years ago when they were just farmers yeah. and their form of money was cattle and animals. Yeah. Yeah, right. So how do we now trans transition to applying that and those analogies and those stories to a people today? But I really believe the reason why we see more conversation about money than we see about all these other things yeah. is because God knew the heart of man. Yeah. And we see in the book of Malachi when he says, there's we used to, when, G, when God said in the book of Malachi, he was literally saying, hey, test me in the area of money. Mm -hmm. He didn't say test me with worship. I dare you to worship me. <laughs> I, you can out sing a brother. I, I can't sing right I dare right. you. See what happened if you yeah, worship yeah, yeah, yeah. me. He didn't say, I dare you to read your Bible. <laughs> I dare you to read. See what happens if you read your Bible. I dare you to pray. Right. No, he said, I dare you to give. Yeah. There and see if I would not open the windows of heaven and cause your like that was the only area of our life that he literally called us out on because he knew he knows how connected money is to the heart because the Bible says it where your treasure is there your heart will be also mm -hmm. so I believe the reason why God has placed money in the Bible so many times is because he cares so much about our heart it's big time how did you start flipping your 50 bucks into building your company because you know you're watching your interview people, food stamps at a 10 million dollar company what so uh so how did you start you got you got this little bit of seed yep and and so how did you start progressing at that what were your moves for sure so going now bait practical mm -hmm. practical moves was definitely finding a prop that you see that you can solve i call the circle of purpose okay. all right and the first p in the circle of purpose is problem what problem do I feel called to solve? What is it? Is it you know helping people with money, helping people with relationships, helping people get fit, health? Mm -hmm. What like what problem do you look out in the world and it irritates you? It makes you mm -hmm. mad that people are struggling with it. People don't know how to solve it. Whatever it is, right? You identify that problem, write it down, make it clear. For me, it was I saw singles staying single longer than they should, and I'm like, yo. Is it based on an age group? That, that's P number. That's P. That's okay. P number two. Okay. okay. Me, so me, it's problem, and then you move into people. Gotcha. Because it's like once you identify the problem of, yeah. hey, I, I'm seeing singles okay. that are having a hard time getting married, and this is a problem that I had gotcha. as a single man. God, why am I still single? What am I doing wrong? Okay. I asked all those very questions. So then I look out. Yeah. Wow, a lot of people are struggling with this. Yeah. Then you go into people. Now, who are the people struggling with this? I think I found one. I think married people that shouldn't be married. <laughs> I find Woo. another. I find another P myself because that, that would be my mold. And when I was 23 years old, yeah. I shouldn't have gotten married at the age I got married to who I got married. So because you, yeah. you weren't prepared. Correct. Boom. And there that's what we end up moving into that business. I yeah. call it the marriage preparation business because we realized people, yeah. wanted, people were wanting us to go help married couples. Yeah. And I'm like, they're already messed up. The really the way to help marriage and end a divorce rate is to get yeah. them before they get married. Which Correct. is what you just said. Exactly. And so that's where you move from P number one is problem. P number two is people. Who are your people? 30 year old black woman out of college realizing I'm still single, messing with dudes that she shouldn't be messing with, mm -hmm. about to cause herself to throw her whole, her whole life off by getting pregnant with some guy she'd never want to get pregnant with. That's my person. All right, now, go into now. What is that, that final P? Or the brother that got five baby mamas. Or the guy that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that yeah. desires marriage, uh. can't. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Keep a girl. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Those are those are my people. And then now I'll go into proficiency. And that's the big practical piece. Pro proficiency. proficiency okay. Which is what is the skill set that you possess to solve that problem? Love proficiency. It. Okay. What is the thing that you know how to do so well that when you talk to that person, you it, it could be your story. Yeah. It can be a service yeah. that you know how to lay out a, a yeah. game plan, a framework. It can be whatever the thing is. What is your skill? Yeah. And that's where most people fail. Yeah. Is that they come with a passion for the problem, they mm -hmm. come with passion for yeah. the people, yeah. but they don't have a passion to develop the skill to suck at something for yeah. a season yeah. and come and become the best at it. I know I'm, I'm talking real good, right? <laughs> and then the final P is profit. How do I now create a product that can solve that problem? That was the strategy that I used to create my business. You also talk about uh, um, having a conversation here about uh, creating um, 
content. Uh, I forgot what word you used. Uh, you were talking to Anthony O'Neill. We were talking about yeah, Anthony O'Neill earlier. Brother. You talk, you talk about um, a transformational content. Yeah. So a little bit more practicality then. So what is your process of creating transformational content? So if somebody finds a problem, the people, right? How do you create the, then the transformational content that gets them to want to move? So basically transformational content is I, how we define it in our business is transformation is the space between information and change. Okay. So what happens is that your podcast, your YouTube channel, your mm -hmm. whatever method that you're getting someone to hear the information, mm -hmm. right? That's step one, to just yeah. attract them yeah. to hearing. Yeah. But that is not the end. What we're seeing in our day is that we are in the information age. Right. So there's an overflow of information, but a lack of transformation. And the only way for there to be transformation, which is there to be legitimate change, yeah. is there for it to be application. I gotta write this down, man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I gotta, I gotta write this stuff down, man. Come on, baby. He's not only preaching, but he's teaching. <laughs> information. Uh, um, the gap between inf transformation, transformation is information and change. You're hearing the information. Now, how do I get you to now take that information, apply it to your life? That's the space. Application to where you now experience true change. And that's what people want. So transformational content is not just giving you information. It's giving you the practical steps and process and, most importantly, accountability. And that's something. Some of this stuff is, I'll start you off. You may be able to get my information for free, but you're not going to get my entire process to change for yeah, free. Right. Because I don't believe you will commit to the process for free. I believe it's got to cost you something. It's got to be some skin in the game. You got, you yeah. got to pay attention, and the only way to pay attention is to pay some yeah. money. Yeah. And so that's where we started to create transformational content. Yeah. Was at a place where we begin to help people to see the difference between the information you're getting on YouTube yeah. versus the information you're getting in a course, a cohort, a mastermind, a, any form of a way that you're getting into behind the scenes. Yeah. How do I now take this information and actually see myself change in it? And uh, by the way, just right there, I hope somebody took that. And uh, you send a message to Jamal here and how you've actually, uh, that's part of your accountability, you send a message to Jamal here and how you've incorporated what you've learned here. Um, when, when you're looking at, you know, the excuses people make, the limiting beliefs, you know, listen, people tell you, man, bro, I'm from the hood, I'm from the South, yeah. I don't come from money, I'm black, I'm brown, I've been disenfranchised, the system's racist, all those different things, but yet here you are. Yes, sir. With a $10 million company, yes, what would sir. you say to that person? Great question. And it's a question that I have had many arguments with friends um, that, you know, we definitely all, being a black mm -hmm. male in America, um, I mean, the racial issues that we're seeing sure. is absolutely, um, you know, tragic, man. It's, mm -hmm. it's traumatic, it's sad, but the reality is that it's real. But in no way does it give me an excuse to just simply look at the issue and feel sorry for myself. If anything, and I don't know, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if this is the Christ-like behavior, mm -hmm. but if anything, it enrages me mm. with ambition <laughs> to prove. This is the opposite of what people are feeling. Yeah. This is opposite. I'm like, yo, time out. That doesn't make me look at myself yeah. like, oh, poor me, look at me, I'm behind. My grandfather, my great-great-grandfather was a slave and we ain't got nothing, we ain't never gonna have nothing. I'm not gonna throw a pity party. Yeah. If anything, I am yeah. enraged with ambition to prove Everyone that says I can't, wrong. You look at the color of my skin, you don't know how much of my bank account. You don't know what organizations I'm funding. Mm -hmm. You don't know what cars I drive. The only thing you see when you walk with me or walk and see me is yeah. my color of my skin. Yeah. Well, I'm going to show you. Because yeah. you may treat me wrong and one day you may be the person that I'm funding your organization. Or I'm saying no to you in the boardroom. So these are the things that come, that come into my mind yeah. and my heart. And right. I don't know if that's Christ-like or not, but well, in the day for me it is a motivation Right. When it comes to race and seeing the inequalities of how can we rise above yeah. the narrative and show what we're capable of. I think you realize, help me understand if my read is correct. Yeah. I think what you realize that externally there is an injustice. Externally yes. things aren't right. But also what a man think of, oh, so is in his heart, so is he, right? Preach, man. Preach. So even though it's external. Yes, sir. It's not internal for you. And that's why it enrages you with that ambition to say, you know yes. what, let me push back. Yes. And let me be an example, because I see so many social uh, media profiles, uh, whether they're influencers or people are following their influence, and all they're doing is complain, complain, yes, injustice, sir. injustice, rage, rage, but no solution. No solution. 
But yet you're talking about the solution. And guess what? We are the solution. Mm. I'm sorry. The White House is not the solution. Your house is. The government is not the solution. <laughs> Your house, yeah. You are the solution. Yeah. We've got to rise up. Yeah. And we've got to be the thing that the world needs. And that's why God placed me here in this moment, in this time. Yeah. I believe in the Bible says that he formed me and he fashioned me. Yeah. That means that every single thing that he created within me, he says it. I am a work of art. I'm his masterpiece yeah. created for good works, which meant that Everything that I was born to do and yeah. created to do, he's invested in me already to be able to do it because he formed me. He made me. Yeah. So my personality, my nature, my perspective, my in, whatever the thing, all the stuff, my, yeah. my, my laugh, my way I communicate, way I yeah. talk, yeah. stop looking at everybody else and yeah. what they're saying you can do, what they're yeah. saying you can't do. Yeah. Stop comparing yourself and look within yeah. and see everything that God's already put in you <sighs> and, and become one with it yeah. and embrace it. And you know, my pastor is like this, the only way for you to be able to tap into your unique difference is to be different. <laughs> you can't yeah. be different yeah. and not be different. Yeah. yeah. Like there's, it's impossible. And so what, that's you, something that I talk on. Um, how do you feel about Kanye's transformation? <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's legit? I mean, it's- uh, Man, I, you, know, it's, I, you know, when it comes to you know, I, I think it's more than pop culture. It's 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 culture. It's 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 a it's for me. I'm a marketer. That's a yeah. skill that I have, right? Sure, sure. I know how to market things. I know how to make it to where a mass amount of people desire to embrace or opt into a thing. Yeah. And he is highly skilled Big at time. marketing. Yeah. Highly skilled at marketing. So I do have a hard time separating what is authentic and what is strategic. Yeah. Got it. And that's me being honest. Sure, sure, sure. What is all, because I don't know him. I don't know him personally. Because the very same thing that I'm sure someone else is, or I'm saying about Kanye, mm. I'm sure someone said about me. Man, this is the guy Jamal doing these yeah. big old Facebook challenges. He's getting 80, 90,000 singles every year, signing up for these challenges, making millions of dollars off these singles. Yeah. Praying, helping them to pray for their future spouse. Yeah. He's a great marketer. Is he authentic? They got to get to know you. You got to know me. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to see the fruit. Yeah. And it's not easy to get to know a A-list celebrity it's because not. they're they're pretty much walled off. You know, try to get around the Kardashians, right? You're not going to get to know them. You're not going to get to know them. So that's yeah. the part where I would say we see that what he's doing is effective. Mm -hmm. It is drawing masses of people. But we will only know when we get to heaven mm -hmm. when God says that everything you've done on earth, but the stuff that lasts is the impact you had on people. That's what will be burned up. Here, here's how I process it. Here's how I process it. I mean, by the way, great music. Yep. I mean, we, we've used his music in, in, our, in, our, in our reels and whatnot. I mean, just some of the music he puts out there is just awesome. But the way I, I process it, you know, how much, how much of the, how much, how many, does, does, would Natasha know that you're lying? Like if, if she, if she said that, if you're, in a, in, in, if you're in, a, in a lie or you're living a lie, you think Natasha would either know it and or call you out on it? If she knew, absolutely. Yeah. But there's definitely moments where I've lied and she didn't know. <laughs> okay. But eventually, it, those, do those lies eventually come okay. out? Absolutely. Okay. So it's not like, like you might lie for a day, a yeah. week, a month, maybe even a year yeah. if you're good. Yeah. But eventually, it, the lie gets exposed. It's going to catch up. Okay. So do you think that Kim Kardashian knows that he's living a lie? Which, would, would, you know, they have kids together, they have a family together. Yes. So, so, so my indication would be when does Kim flip? I want to know when she flips because if it's true, if it's honest, he should be able to lead his family, lead his life. Now it's either she flips or they get divorced. Correct. And I, I, you know, one of those, in my opinion, one of those two will eventually have to happen because he cannot live a type of life. It would be very difficult for him to live a type of life that he wants to honor God. Yeah. But yet his wife, right, which is his first ministry, mm -hmm. his you know, his bride, exactly. is still going off in the world doing her thing. And you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the closest person to you, the your one wife. that knows everything about yeah. you, is your wife. Um, and we expect her to call him out to, mm -hmm. you know, all the things. But, man, we don't know where her basis is, yeah. where her foundation is. So it's really challenging to make judgments yeah. on these people when we're only getting fed the information from yeah. media yeah. and from news channels that we can't even trust their angles. We can't yeah. even trust their perspectives. Sure. So these are the things that, that's why I be, I'm very careful to put my mouth on things that I know I can't, 
know the real truth yeah. versus if I'm sitting down with you person to person and yeah. I can at least get a vibe or yeah. energy or mm -hmm. a sense of discernment from the Spirit of God by being yeah. around you yeah. of what I believe I think it, the, the, the situation is. Yeah. At the end of the day, I haven't had that with Kanye nor Kim, yeah. so I can't really say, hey, this is what Kim should or she yeah. should be able to do because I don't know her I don't know him. Gotcha. Yeah, so, well, we'll keep, we'll keep <laughs> both of them yeah. in, in prayer. And uh, I think we'll, we'll eventually get to the bottom of it. You know, I'm, I'm hoping for the best. Yeah. I, I want him to, to continue to you know, make God known and, and yeah, to, bro, to, make to minister. Famous. Yeah, make, yeah, exactly. Um, but God I'm, can use anything, right? And I think that's the thing that we as Christians don't like that idea, but we say it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. God can use anything he wants, but when he does, we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and do I believe that God can use Kanye? Absolutely. Hey, hey. Amen. Yeah, what, a, what, a, what a great message he would continue to, to, to spread out there. Uh, if, you know, that's, that's yeah. his, his thing, because you know, like you said earlier, it's, it's, it's marketing, it's selling records, all these different things. Um, God knows. Yes, sir. Uh, so when we're, when we're looking at, you know, uh, um, I want to talk about, uh, before I go back to a money conversation, I'm talking back to you, and Natasha. You know, you guys, your, your business, you're, you're creating this transformational content. What are some of the key indicators would you guide somebody into choosing the right spouse? Out for, for, from a man's perspective. Because the majority of my channel is men. Okay. It's like, it's like it. what, 55% men? 55, 45%. 45% nice. women. Nice. So let's do it. We'll, we'll do both. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to do this. Let's be gentlemanly. Let's start with ladies. Okay? Um, it applies to both. It can, oh, okay. It, it really so it's universal apply. truth. Yeah. Okay. Universal. Cool. So, universal. so how would somebody go about choosing yeah. the right spouse? So this is a great question. Um, where I start with the conversation that's very different. She got to look good. I don't start no? with, no, I, no. Don't, <laughs> I don't start okay, with okay, your okay. spouse. Okay, okay, okay. I believe the foundational skill set, because I believe choosing the right spouse is a skill. The foundational skill set that you develop to choose the right spouse starts with choosing the right friends. Interesting that you say that. Because the Bible says, right, that a friend sits closer than a brother, right? So we get that there's this concept where there's a value system for friendship. And if we go into marriage, we will see most people think, and you know this is a married mm -hmm. man, mm -hmm. that majority of your marriage is kissing and bumping and Netflix and chilling, right? It's like, yo, I got a woman that's going to be able to lay down all the time for me, right? Come on, I, I want to be honest with you. Yeah. Sex is, what, maybe 30, 40 percent? Yeah. Uh, maybe at maximum. Yeah. How, what percent would you give sex? Sex? Probably 10. Exactly. You, <laughs> you saw the look on my face. I was, gonna, I was being generous. Yeah, very, very, I knew very, you were going to be generous. honest. Might be it's even single 10. digits. Not to say that's not important. And But guess what? That 10% yeah. is amazing. Of course. It's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, unbelievable. But what's the 90? Oh, it, it's uh, processing issues and, and doing life together and running a business together and raising our family together. and Majority of the things that it takes to have a successful marriage, mm -hmm. you have to learn. You can learn how to do in a successful friendship. So I say like this. If you can't be a successful friend, you're not going to be a successful spouse. So the first place that I encourage people is to evaluate their friendships and see which of your friends have you been able to endure the longest, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, what kind of friend are you? Okay. That's the first place I, I challenge, because then it really gets them up, because what happens when you start going into spouse stuff, mm -hmm. future spouse, they start going into dreaming, yeah. ev imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But starting with a friendship, it makes it real, because they have friends, yeah. or they may not have friends. Yeah. And they're like, dang, I ain't got no friends. <laughs> and I'm like, you mean to tell me? You think you're going to be able to keep a woman that you've got to take care of? I mean, I'm talking about sharing bank accounts, I'm talking yeah. about sharing beds, I'm talking about sharing all kind of stuff. And you've got a friend, you ain't got nobody that you can just like yeah. ride out with, yeah. go on a vacation, kick it with, and say, peace out, homie, deuce, we're going to go yeah. out separate houses. Like a friend that don't require you to pay for nothing, mm -hmm. a friend that doesn't require you to have to apologize every time mm -hmm. you make them mad, and you haven't learned how to have an enduring friendship. Yeah. So that's where we start. That's start, step number one is evaluating your friendships. Wow. That's the first step in choosing the right spouse. Now we move into number two, which is now your ability to choose yourself. This is, what do I value about me? Yeah. What, but can I make a comment on number one? Yeah, please. Um, when I got married, when I was thinking about getting married to my now wife, it's the first thing I was double checking because in my mind, with all the pain I went through, I've always wondered if we get into an argument, who you calling? <laughs> like who you calling? Yeah, uh, is is it. it is it an ex boyfriend? Yeah, uh, you know she had, she had a kid already. Yeah, is she calling her uh, baby daddy? Yeah, is she you know, is she calling another dude? Is she hanging out at the bar? You know, uh, having a rebound type of drink? Yep, I, I don't know. And then more so, 
If she does talk to a friend, do they defend her? Do they defend me? Or do they defend us, their relationship? Wow, because your friendships, yeah. you know you know the quote, yeah. you, you are the sum total of your friendships, right? Mm -hmm. Like in regards to you're the average of whatever that yeah. quote, whatever that quote is. And it's really true. Your friendships, re your friends really do determine your path. And I'm in the same way. When I met yeah. my wife, I wanted to get, I wanted to go out with you and your friends. I yeah. wanted to see how were you with Actually, your Actually, you, you met her online, so you got a double, 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 double. Double, double, <laughs> right? So between her family and her friends, I was very interested to see her dynamic and yeah. who she was. Yeah. Because these are the people between your family, how do you treat them? Because these are the people that you didn't choose. Yeah. You were just stuck with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So she's a Cali girl though, right? Yeah, Cali girl. My, my wife's a Cali girl. Nice. She's Sacramento. Where's your, where's your wife from? Um, from? From Temecula, San Diego area. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yep. So in the South. Mm -hmm. So was there a different values and principles that you had differently been being raised? Kind of like I asked you when oh, you were in high absolutely. school? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so she valued rest and chill. <laughs> and <laughs> my, my wife and you have to get along. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just like, hey, let's enjoy the day. And me and you and are I'm out like, there. enjoy, yeah, enjoy. Yeah. What? We ain't got nothing. We got work to do. You know, so yeah, we definitely had some different value systems, you know, but we balance each other out. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, but when it came down to choosing, you know, once I, you know, evaluate your ability to choose friends, then you're choosing yourself, which is your purpose, which is your destiny. Yeah. Now we can move into choosing your spouse. And yes, attraction definitely is a big part of that. So that that's number two, though. Yeah. No, number number no, number three. That's number three. It's, well, it's the the skill set is choosing yeah. friends, yeah. choosing you, now choosing a person. Go back to you. What, what do you mean going to you? So let's skip. Yeah, I, I'll kind of breeze yeah. that one through. Yeah. But choosing you is taking the time to truly understand your strengths, your weaknesses. Because what it is is that I say when you are marrying somebody, you're not saying to them, hey, I do yeah. to you yeah. for the rest of my life and it's only future based. No, no, you're saying I do to their past, to their junk, to their mess, to their unhealed stuff. All You're saying I do to all of them. Yeah. And if you aren't aware, <laughs> it's real. And when, yeah. if you're not aware of yeah. what a person is saying I do to, so you can help them yeah. Versus you just being like, I didn't know that was there. Yeah, or, 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 or I hope for the best. <laughs> I hope for the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah. Versus you taking the time to say, hey, I've, I can't, I'm not perfect, but here are the things I have gone through. That's mess. Yeah. But then now, here are the things that have become messages in my life. Here's what I know I've been called to do. Here's what I've been graced to do. I'm not saying you need to know everything, but you need to have an inkling about who you are and why you are. And you should, ha I said like this, you should have spent the season dating you before you spent this season trying to date other people. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that's the you conversation. For, so transparency, when, when I got divorced and I became a single parent with yeah. three kids, um, you know, obviously the you might, YouTube subscribers may or may not know this, but uh, from a period of 30 years old, I just want to give my life to the Lord. I said, okay, God, I tried it my way. Let me try it your way now. And I spent my entire 30s or paying the mistakes in my 20s, right? And, but once I started following his way, yeah. he not only helped me recoup what I lost, but psh, accelerated me 20, 30 times. Yes, sir. Because I started surrendering to that, uh, to that, uh, to that, uh, to the spirit. And when we're, when we're looking at, you know, um, how I used to look and how most men look at the relationship, the reason why I joked about it in the beginning, she got to look good because that's it. Yeah. And then you realize six months later, she got just as much bad breath as you do. Yes, sir. <laughs> Right? She's got bad habits as much as you do. Yes, sir. She does the toilet paper upside down than you do the toilet paper and the toothbrush all over the place and she's either uh, very clean and you're un, un, you know, you're not clean and she, you know, or you're very unclean and she's very clean. Yeah. Either way in terms of the house and being tidy around the house. What I call it is you're looking for someone who's holistically attractive. Not just externally, but internally. Holistic yeah. attraction. And that the internal will last. Yes. That will last longer. And now granted, yeah. you God wants you to be happy. Mm -hmm. God wants you to enjoy sure. the wife of your youth. Sure. Come on. So you definitely need to be able to get a little arousal when you see your wife come out of the bathroom naked. You know, I'm not, I don't want you looking at me like, Boop. you know what I'm saying? You be like, now Hold granted, you, you know, if, as, if you're yeah. dropping and, and yeah. dropping, gaining weight, and yeah. she's, you can't come at her if, yeah, you, right, if right. you're gaining and she's gaining. Y'all yeah. both doing it together. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Continue to respect her body as you ain't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I do think you got to have an equal standard, right? But at the end of the day, um, attraction is huge, but I do believe if your heart is in alignment with God, attraction will be more than just physical. Yeah. When you, you will be initially attracted by the physical, which will cause you yeah. to be motivated to have a conversation, right. cause you to be motivated, but once you get to talk to her, yeah. you should become even more attracted. Yeah. You should not go from a place of, dang, she's fine. Yeah. Oh, she's beautiful. To meeting her and being like, I'm glad she's fine. <laughs> I'm glad she's beautiful. <laughs> Woo! Now I should be like, oh my gosh, she's fine. And she's yeah. got brain. Yeah. 
man, she challenged yeah. me. She's, and that's where you will have a lasting relationship. Yeah. So one thing I posted the other day on social media was I didn't marry just for love. I married for money. Because I believe that when God says it's not good for man to be alone, you would think that I, it's not like, <laughs> you, you, you weren't ready for that. Hear me when I, 86% of millionaires are married. Sure. Yeah. When God said it is not good for man to be alone, yeah. it was right after he gave him the mandate yeah. to go forth in the earth and to produce, to take over, to reign. And it was soon after that moment, God said it's not good for man to be alone, which meant that God was not giving Adam a helpmate just for companionship. Yeah. He was giving Adam a helpmate so he could help him build. You need a woman who can help you build. Yeah who can help you take the vision that God has given you mm -hmm. and take it to the next level. Yeah. So when I say I didn't just marry for love, I married yeah. for money because I was marrying someone who was going to help me yeah. make money, sure. who was going to help me produce, who would help me steward in the seasons of abundance, help yeah. me sacrifice in the seasons of, of hardship, <laughs> who will help me pray when we don't know what to do, <laughs> who will help me go out and see opportunities. When, like, I need a woman yeah. who's my partner. I don't need, a, I don't need yeah. just a love partner. I need a purpose partner. That's what you're looking for. So the moment you are initially attracted as a man, yeah. the next thing you've got to check mark is, is there purpose here? Go into the Bible. When God said that whole term of, I want to help create a helpmate who is suitable for you. Yeah. This is something we teach in our program. That word suitable has been replaced with compatible. And if you look at the Webster dictionary definition of compatibility versus suitability, it's drastically two different definitions. Compatibility is the ability to be with one person without any conflict or problems. Wow. Yeah, because you're, comp compact. you're, you're compact in there. With, with large, not compact, you're, I get it. I'll ask you this question. Yeah. Is there any relationship that has any problems or conflict? Of course, all the time, especially when you're compact. Exactly. <laughs> so compatibility is yeah. not the basis of the relationship. Yeah. Compatibility are the things that cause relationships to overflow. Yeah. It's the things that cause you to be like, dang, yeah. man, we really just get along. We yeah. laugh at the same yeah. things, we enjoy the same music, but those should not be the foundational decision makers for that marriage. It's the things that just make the relationship gravy, mm -hmm. icing on the cake. Ooh, man, we got, and, that, and not everything will be yeah. the things that cause you to be compatible. But then if you go into what God said in the Bible, I'm gonna create a helpmate who is suitable, suitable. for you. Suitable, if you look at the definition, the dictionary definition of suitability is right or fit for purpose. Right or fit for purpose. Make sure we put the, the <laughs> graphic right here. <laughs> <laughs> right or fit for purpose. Okay. So suitability should be the initial thing you're checking the box on, which is, is this person fit for purpose? Yeah. Can we build together? Yeah. Are we going in the same direction? Are we equally yoked? Do what we call have non-negotiable qualities about one another that are like, yo, these, yeah. she loved Jesus. Yeah. Hey, this woman has the ability to be frugal. She's not out here just being frivolous and spending all, because I can't, yeah. did, what are the non-negotiable? And then you move into the compatible things. Mm -hmm. And we both like going to the movies. Yeah. We both love hiking. Yeah. Like these are the things that make the relationship fun and enjoyable. So suitable first. Suitable first. You know, it's uh, my, my wife, when we got married, we were bro broke as a joke. I mean, we had a you know, we're at a point in our life where uh, things weren't financially right. Yes, sir. And um, I knew she was suitable for me. Yes, sir. Because she says, babe, I don't care about investing in the wedding and having a bunch of people and they're partying on our dime and maybe three, four, five years from now, 90% of them aren't even in our lives anymore. So I don't feel good investing in a wedding for one big glorified party. I do, however, invest, want to invest in our marriage. Come on. So I told me. And we, we, we got married right away. We were supposed to just get married in our pastor's office and our families found out of it. They said, no, wait till next Saturday, we'll all fly in. And what's supposed to be, you know, four people in a wedding it ended up to be 40, 50 people at a church. And we had our wedding downstairs in a church basement with Crazy. bottled water, potluck. Everybody brought a dish. I got uh, all sorts of friends from different ethnic groups. We had the uh, Mexican rice next to the Puerto Rican rice. <laughs> you know, right? We had the uh, fried oh, chicken and jerk chicken. My wife, is, my, my wife is a half white, half black. Uh, uh, Cuban and American Indian. Woo! My yeah. goodness, that's, come that's, on somebody. That's, that's she baby. got heaven in there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, for sure. <laughs> but it's interesting, I just Googled the last president that was single because our, our country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Yes, sir. And uh, I believe 55 out of the 56 men who signed uh, the document were Bible-believing, faith-based Christians. 
the, the, the founders of our country. Yeah. And uh, they believed in, in the institution of marriage. And the last president that was single was the 15th president of the United States from 1857 That's crazy. to 1861. James Buchanan uh, served immediately prior to the Civil War. Wow. Right? That's and after that, statement. Abraham Lincoln took over. The Republican Party got started to, to, to have one purpose in mind, which was to abolish slavery. And here he is. He remains the only president to be elected from Pennsylvania to remain a lifelong Same bachelor. Man. That's crazy. The, the last single president to that, be there. So it's honorable to, if you don't have a country to run, you got a family to run, yeah. and it's better for you to run it, husband uh, and wife. Yes, sir. <laughs> right? So uh, I want to ask you this question, too, as well, because often, oftentimes, you know, I want to go back to, back to, to money. By the way, you gave a profound answer there with uh, uh, Choose the Right Spouse, and I'm pretty sure we can unpack that further, and you need to check out uh, 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 the what was it? Uh, Miller Media Group. Check yeah. Out Miller so the Media program Group. for that yeah. one, we have different schools. Okay. So we have a series of schools. Um, if you go click, like if you see our brands, you'll see the different schools that we have. Um, and the school that I'm talking about right now is the One University, which is TOU. Um, that school focuses on. You have to go to the One University.com. Um, that school focuses on helping men and women prepare for marriage. Um, there you go. And by the way, this is so important. The reason why I'm heavy on this is because one of the biggest ways to reverse your financial life is picking wrong. Wow. Picking wrong. There's so many people. I'm in a, I'm in a financial service. I can't tell you how many 50, 60-year-olds that I have, uh, they're financially successful. They just got divorced. Man. And they say, you know, house is split up. Yeah. 401K is split up. The yeah. business is split up. Worse, the kids are split up. And uh, it's the worst uh, scenario that happens to them. So if we can fix this from the get-go, pick, you know, pick right from jump, you know, instead of reversing things at 50, 60 years old, you're 100,000, you know, because what was it, what's the scripture? One can set flight to 1,000, two. two can set flight to 10,000. 10, yes, it's sir. an exponential math. Exponential. Right. Yep. And two are better than one because it's a better return on their investment, a better <laughs> return on their labor. Right. And that's that whole piece, man, that, which is why it's important about who you choose to marry because I do believe what you just said is absolutely true. Who you choose to marry will have the biggest indicator on your ability to build wealth here on this earth. It's a profound thing. I mean, it's, 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 it cannot be underscored. And I think today, because everything's so visual, social mm -hmm. media. Yes, sir. You know, um, you, know you, you look on social media and you're looking for one thing. Next thing you know, flesh shows up. You know, YouTube, you know what I'm talking about? You know, uh, bikinis show up and six pack abs show up and you get distracted. Yeah. And, the, uh, you know, it would be so hard to be a young man today mm -hmm. because, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to be this way, but it makes you distracted over here. And that's something that uh, uh, even, even more so is, is, is so important. So when we're talking about money, um, you're even thinking about cutting back on your giving, right? Absolutely. The thought was like, okay, babe, but we're tight. God, we're tight. You know we're tight. And God understands. That's right. what I, that was the thought. God right. gets it. Okay. And so should somebody feel faith-based guilt when they can't give as much as they can through a tough time? No, I think the reality is, is that it shouldn't be faith-based guilt. It should be conviction okay. that you're not believing God on his word. Okay. And that's what I felt. When I, because what I'm looking at, I'm looking like, God, you understand, but I'm still funding and paying for all these other things, but I can't give my 10%. To me, and I don't even so believe, I don't even believe, I don't, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go okay. there. I don't believe in, I, I have a whole teaching there. I, I, so long, I love it, yeah. The teaching there is basically in a five second explanation is that I believe the 10% is equivalent to the training wheels that you ride on a bicycle. The training wheels are simply there to teach you how to balance yourself. But the goal is never to stay on training wheels. The goal is that eventually you'll get off the training wheels and be able to ride that bike freely and go wherever you want to go whenever you want to do it. I believe that's how God, the tie was created to be the training wheels, to teach us the, the foundation, yeah. the beginning point. Hey, if you're going to start being generous, start with 10% yeah. of your income. Yeah. But the moment you got it and I you're like starting that. to see the fruit yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. starting to see the overflow. Keep going. What should you do? <laughs> Increase. You don't stay at 10%. <laughs> you don't stay on the training wheels. Yeah. You go to the mountaintop. Yeah, you yeah, ride yeah. your, you start yeah. giving away houses and cars. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I believe. And nobody, when they hear that teaching, they yeah. flip out because they're like, I don't want to stay on the training wheels. Yeah. You've been on the training wheels for the last 15 years because that's what you've been taught, that all that God wants is your 10%. Sure. That's not what he wants. No thought process, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, but give unto God what is God's. Now, in giving to Caesar, we can minimize what we give to Caesar. Yes, sir. Because there, uh, there's that saying, there's nothing more, there's nothing more patriotic Preach than it. to pay what one er owes in tax, but not to overpay what, owe, what yes, owes sir. in tax. But that doesn't necessarily go with 
faith-based conviction? No. Faith-based conviction is because it's not going back to fund things that you don't even know what you're funding. Yeah. I believe faith-based conviction is that I need to, number one, yeah. protect my heart from allowing money to become mammon yeah. and to, be, to rule me. Mm -hmm. That's why we start, I, that's why I, I value the principle of giving because I want to make sure my heart stays humble and surrendered yeah. to God and his ability to do for me more than I can ever do for myself, <laughs> number one. Then number two, I want to stay connected to what God is doing in the earth. Yeah. And I know I want to use my money, my resources to do that. So whatever way I can yeah. do that, if that's given to this organization, creating that organization, doing whatever it is. Last year, my wife gave away $150,000, you know, of our income last year to 10 different organizations. Yeah. And man, we felt so connected to the mission. Yeah. Did it change me? No, because I've just, I've been, I've been consistently doing my thing to keep my heart at bay. Yeah. But it, it made me feel good to be even further connected to what God was doing. Yeah. to know that my father was pleased. And so it wasn't even about me getting more. No, I know God's gonna take care of me. I see them year after year after year, take me from glory to glory to glory. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah, it's consistently, you know, my good friend Mike Todd came out with a new book, Crazy Faith. And bro, like, when you get to a place where you are giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars, it does not ever get easy. Because the moment you break through one level, God's gonna challenge you to go to another level. <laughs> yeah. When I gave away that thousand dollar, you better believe it was no more than two years later that I was about to give away five thousand and God said do ten. And I was like, ten? And he's like, what I do? What what happened when you gave away the thousand? That's right. That's right. And this is what I prayed. I said, God, yeah. I'm about to give ten thousand dollars. This time I don't need an idea. I want assets. I want a property. I want real estate. Now we own an eight hundred thousand dollar corporate office space that's fully um, occupied with 10 different units. Uh, you have office, tenants in there too as tenants, well. Tenants, wow. whole nine, cash pay, flowing, paying your rent. Paying yeah. the rent, whole nine. Good for you, man. Absolutely. We, we own the deed to that property. Wow. Almost a million dollar property, we own it, cash. That $10,000 seed was what I prayed. I sold it, <laughs> and now I got a million dollar property. That's how God yeah. works. But where yeah. God's been convicted me, you, yeah. you think I'm done? Yeah. There's more. See, the, the visual I'm getting is like, everybody's like this with money. Like a fist versus God wants you to go school like this. And here's the other part. Yeah. Doesn't matter where you give it. Doesn't matter. Where, local Does it, I think the local church. Matter? I think local church has to be the first, the first area the that you The storehouse. Of course, that's the storehouse, yeah. But then some will say, hey, do I have to give it to the church? In order for it to be used as a way of God blessing it to cause increase. I, th I think it just makes sense because that's the that's the house that uh, you're being uh, developed Fair. in, right? And if you're being Fair. developed, in, how much more people can, because and, because I, I face it too because family says, well, you need to go back, you know, to the Philippines where you're from, right? So I, I feel convicted about it. So I said, well, why don't we do both? That's an offering, but this is the tithe. There you go. So I, that's why I, I, yeah. I, I agree with that. I yeah. believe the tithe goes back to your storehouse, back to your house. Right. You give the tithe there. Where, and however much that is, that's 20%, mm -hmm. 30%, whatever your, my pastor says like this, yeah. wherever your faith level is, that's yeah. where you give. Yeah. If your faith level is at 1%, you give yeah. it 1%. Yeah. God's not mad. Yeah. If your faith level is at 5%, you give it 5%. If it's at 10, you give it at 10. Wherever it's at, whatever you want to be blessed on, yeah. that's the tithe. But then the offering is over and above. One of my favorite things to do uh, during the uh, season where all the kids are going back to school is I just camp out at like, because uh, I got to do my own shopping for my own kids. But I'm also observing the kids. I can, I can tell. I can tell the look of mom and yeah. dad shopping. They're having a hard time. And yeah. they got to buy shoes. They got to buy this. And, That's good, man. And I'm observing. And I just tell the cashier, hey, listen, that, that uh, family right there, the next three families behind them, put it on this cart. I'm going to walk away, but I want you to charge everything they got on this cart. And I'll come back. I don't want them to know who it's coming from. I don't, know, I don't, I don't want you pointing point to me. Yes, sir. But here's what I, do want you, what I do want you to tell them. Tell them that God loves them. Come on. Right? Yeah, man. <laughs> to remind them. Come on, man. And so I, I'm just looking at their faces. They're pretty like, like this. They're crying. Like, oh, yes. I was at the gym the other day. I'm getting, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this, yeah. but this lady, she came in with a walker. I can tell she's young, but somehow, some way she's in a walker. She's kind of, and she's, I'm like, God, she's powering through this. And she's getting to the gym. She wants to exercise. She wants to, she wants to work on staying in shape, even though she's on a walker. And, and obviously she has some form of disability. I, t I tell the trainer, come here. And uh, I said, listen to her, I want to pay for her yearly membership and I want you to personally train her for the year. Wow. I don't want her to know where it's coming from. Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want you to point me out. Yes, sir. But I want you to know and tell her one thing. God loves you. Come on. God loves you. <laughs> That's the awesome thing about the, the position that Come we're on, in. Man. You know, we can do that type of stuff. And that's connected to God's mission, man. And when we're talking about, you know, you know, 
you know, I got a couple of controversial videos out there. Like, God wants you to be a millionaire. Da, 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 da. But, okay, I can get it. It's, I can understand. It's the marketing title. Yeah. But it's not for the purpose of just being a millionaire, just to be a millionaire. No, it's not. It's to be a millionaire to do the things that you and I just talked about. That's it, man. That's why I want to help pay something. The more rich. connected I am to God, if you're saying I'm supposed to spend time with God every day, yeah. what is God talking to you about? What is God saying mm -hmm. to you? Is it just, I love you? I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> cool. No. Yeah, right, right. He's telling you what he cares about. He's telling you what he is passionate about. He's transferring his yeah. grievance yeah. to you. Yeah. And we were called to go change yeah. the world with his grief, what he's, what's grieving him, what's hurting him. Yeah. And so that's what I believe, man. I believe purpose, it yeah. should be the biggest motivation to go out and make as much money as possible so we can be able to fund the things that God cares about. What are some of the... Christian myths, what are some of the faith-based myths about money that you've came to demystify yourself in this journey? Yeah, I mean, now being where we are today, yeah. you know, um, employing, you know, over you know, 20 people nice. full time, um, nice. benefits, the whole nine, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And being able to now, you know, have it where I would say we're at the point where, um, you know, our net worth is at a place where I don't have to struggle or stress about the, 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 how, it's, how it's gonna come, yeah. you know what I'm saying? My goal and my, my perspective is now how to, how to go get more sure. versus trying to stabilize my yeah. home. That's all I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. I'm not worried about how our bills are gonna get paid and yeah. how we're gonna get this yeah. thing and get that, I'm, I'm content. Yeah. And so for me, the myth is that you get to a point to where it's not enough. That's what people think. Yeah. They think once yeah. you start having it, you'll never be satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a lot, yeah. and I can say I'm satisfied. I, I look mm. at my car, I'm grateful for my car, and I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm good. Like, I yeah. may want a sports car sometime soon, yeah. but I'm content. My house, I love my house. Yeah. Now we're gonna get it one we're gonna Dallas, but I'm not sitting out here and like, I'm, if I don't get that sports car in 30 days, I'm not gonna be happy. If I don't get that million dollar home. So my myth number one is that, they're, they're, that once you start making money, you'll never want to stop making money. Mm -hmm. No, 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 it's very different. When you yeah. do it with the right purpose and heart in mind, mm -hmm. you become content with your stuff, yeah. and you become more driven and more motivated to go figure out how to make the world a better place. So I believe you need to learn how to make enough money to where you don't care about yeah. making money. You need to get to a place where you can make and have enough to where you're not worried about how to pay that next paycheck or get that next bill paid. You've gotten so much to where you're forced to figure out how in the world am I going to use all this money God has given me? Because, because if I, I just, by the way, I just Googled because I love the study of words. Because the original text of which the Old Testament and New Testament are written in Hebrew and in Greek converted into English. And you know there's a lot of things lost in translation. Yeah, absolutely. And oftentimes I see words that are lost in translation when it's converted to English. Yeah. And, I, and I go back to etymology. And I, the, something that has never sat in my spirit well with that word content. Yeah. So I just go with the etymology, right? And it comes from a, a, a Latin world, word from, you know, uh, 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 literally to be held or contained within limits. Mm. Does God want you to be held or contained within limits? Not at all. So why should we? Why should we even use the word content? Mm -hmm. So good. I think there's. A, I think there's another yeah. word in Greek. I love it. I love so, it. So, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be stuck. The, the, the definition of an entrepreneur is to take risk, yes. not to be held in contentment or limit and limitations. I think the. I think when you look at it from a place of, it's it's contentment from a place of I am good with this current level, this current status, yeah. in regards to I'm not out here where my life can't continue on if I don't get more. And what I'm saying is, is I've gotten to a place, I know what it was like where I was like, we're not going to make it if we don't make a yeah. money this month or right. this week. Right. You know what I'm saying? We're not right. gonna, and all I'm focusing on is the present. Yeah. But we get to a place where we're grateful, and I do believe there's a better word. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Because I think nowhere does God want us limited, yeah. but we do get to a place where we're satisfied with what we currently have mm -hmm. to where we take our focus off of us yeah. and we look it out to the world. Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't know what word to use for that. But we that's, gotta fight it. <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's the, the, the yeah. concept where how can you have so much money to yeah. where you get to the place where you don't, you're not looking at just your, how do I get my mom a better house? Or yeah. how do I get my family off a of well? No, 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 you're, you've gone beyond, your family's taken care of, your family's family's taken care of. Yeah. Now you're starting to look about yeah. And that's where I think the, the wealthy mindset comes from. That's myth number one. Yeah. I think myth number two definitely comes from the place of this, um, like being in the season that we're in now, mm -hmm. 
it is this fear that you will get taken over by money once you have money, right? This, the topic of the rich young ruler, right? We see these sure. different stories where it's like God calls them out. Yeah. Give all your money away. I got, I can't. Well, that yeah. shows. You don't love me, right? You ain't go that right, right. For me, the myth is, is that the more money you make, the harder your relationship with God becomes. I believe it's absolutely false. I believe the more money you make, the more I need God. The more money you make, yeah. the more I need to lean on Lord, God. Lord, I pay 10 employees, now I gotta pay 100 employees. Well, where, where's the money gonna come from? I need God, you more. Come on, God. I need you now even more. You've got me out here, God. Yeah. Come on. I got $100,000 on payroll, God. Father, I got people that, I got families. And you gave this to me. me. You, you opened the door, you gave me <laughs> access to this. Yeah. So God, so yeah. if anything to me, the more money you make, the more reliant I become on him. Yeah. Yeah. Because I started with him. Yeah. And I need to stay with him. And so most people think, yeah, man, like when you get out there, you're going to leave God. Mm -mm, yeah. I'm not trying to leave God when I get out there. If anything, I'll be like, God, where you at, brother? You got me out here in the middle of the ocean. I can't sink now. That's right. I'm doubling down. So yeah. I'm doubling down. Yeah. So sorry to scream. But uh, oh, so I will say that's another big myth is that you will, yeah. you will get to a place where you stop needing God or gotcha. depending on God. Do one more. One more myth. So for me, I will say myth number three mm -hmm. is regarding relationships. Um, myth number three, it's almost not a myth, it's almost a truth that you will need to be ready. I don't know what the myth is or the mm -hmm. false piece of it, but mm -hmm. I will say something I've learned having money is being ready to handle leeches. Um, and the myth, I guess, could be that um, you will be able to give money to your family and yeah. set everybody free, and you got to be very careful because it's the closest ones to you that won't know how to use it the right way. Yeah. So I've had to set up boundaries and I had to set up certain parameters with my own family yeah. in regards to how we use it so I don't destroy them yeah. and destroy our relationship. I don't know if the myth is there, but there's a truth there. Well, I think the myth is uh, uh, I'm gonna take care of everybody when I get to a certain there level, right? There you go, Matt, right? come on, help me out. And, and so the you, myth is you, you gotta get to a point where, hey, I'm gonna yeah. I'm get so blessed, Yeah. y'all, none of y'all gotta worry about nothing. Right. You don't want that. Because you, you don't actually, wanna become the savior for your family. Right, because, because then you become God. Because you're well, correct, because you're, you're not the enabler, he's the enabler. Yes, sir. And matter of fact, you're the disabler if that's what you're thinking. Yes, sir. Because you now see so preaching. many people that you've disabled because you gave it to them and said, hey man, I put my skin in the game, you were, no, you were nowhere around, but because we grew up together and I, you feel like I owe you something? You know, people are coming up, your family comes out, old friends come out to work and they say, hey, well, I see you driving around this, you see how that, you have a, I see you on the, the interviews and then you owe me something. What do I owe you? I owe you an opportunity, but I don't owe you money. Yeah. I, I, I pay the price for you. You, you got to be so careful that you yeah. don't set your family up or people that you give money to for failure. Yeah. Because they did not attain or, yeah. like for example, I'll give this is a true story. My sister at my sister runs her own little business. She's like Jamal, I need a business loan, and I said I need a presentation. Sure. Treat I me need, like a bank. Treat me like a bank. Yeah, if I'm gonna loan you money, yeah. I need you to walk me through exactly yeah. how this money's gonna be used, yeah. exactly how you're gonna get it back to me with interest. Because yeah. this is not you're not asking me just for I need help to pay my light bill. Set fifty bucks. Yeah. No, this is going to something that's going to produce income. Yeah. And I absolutely am honored that you would come to me. Yeah. And I want to be able to help you because I know the bank is going to turn you down because yeah. you got bad credit. You got I know they're not, <laughs> not going to believe in you. You don't fit in the specific box of the bank. But yeah. guess what? I believe in you. Yeah. But you got to prove to me why. So these, instead of just giving her the money and feeling bad and be like, you're my sister here, I'm forcing her to think. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and, and I'm also making it where, hey, you're gonna give me a little bit back too, yeah. more than what I gave you. Sure. So I'm putting pressure on you yeah. to go make this money back and you're gonna thank me at the end. Right. Yeah. And so I'm setting her up for success. Yeah. Not and, and it's a fair interest rate, not a shark interest no, rate, like a payday all. loan or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Because you go do that, yeah. and you're, you'll never get it. You'll never pay it back. Yeah. And yeah. they don't care about you. They will take you to court, sue you, and take all your money. <laughs> versus me, I'm gonna. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. these are the things that I do believe that we should do with our families, yeah. versus just thinking that we're gonna just give them money and make their lives better. Man, I could take another hour with you and just kick <laughs> it with you, man, and talk about this stuff. So um, <laughs> you're doing. Before we wrap up, man, what are, yeah. you, what are your final thoughts, man? What are your final thoughts to our community out there? It's a seven-figure squad. Yes, sir. They want to become faith-based, first-generation millionaires, yes, cash flow millionaires at that. Love it. What would you tell them? So, looking at the camera, um, I mean, this conversation has been absolutely <laughs> incredible, Matt. I, I've enjoyed it. If I'm talking to you, uh, man of God, you know, woman of God, person that really has a sincere desire to be successful and to do it in a way that you're able to honor God, Here's the thing I would encourage you, my final words, my final thoughts, is 
on this journey of going towards becoming successful, do not fall in love, hear me when I say this, with the promise. The promise is the thing that you believe is, I want to be a millionaire. The promise is, I want to have the house. I want to have the cars. Mm. That's the promise, man. I, and, I'm, and I want you to see the promise, but don't fall in love with the promise. You need to fall in love with the process because it is the process that will and guarantee if for any reason, if for any <laughs> moment, you get the promise and you lose it, you can get it back because you know what it took to get there. So as you're on this journey, going through this process right now, you're not where you want to be. I know you're not. That's why you're listening to Matt and you're getting his information from him because you want to be where he's at. You want to do what we're talking about. Better, better. Better. <laughs> But the reality is, is that you need to value this moment just as much as you would value it if you were sitting right in the middle of your promise, the very thing you're believing God for, whatever you believe in God to be able to do. Fall in love with the process. Make sure you follow Jamal Miller here. We put all of his links in the description below. We'll put it here in the lower third too as well. Make sure you follow his content. Went from food stamps to employing over 20 people to building a $10 million company and being a beacon for the Lord. That being said, guys, I love your thoughts, your questions, your feedback. You agree with us? You don't agree with us? Put it in the comment section below. We'll get back to you. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you please click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. So on behalf of Jamal, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.